Good morning. Welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. Today is April 11th, and it's the second Sunday of Easter. We are excited to worship with you today and glad you are here with us. God's blessings on your worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. He brings us light that shines in our darkness. He brings us life that death cannot overcome. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the epistle, John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us consider our sins so that we do not deceive ourselves with false righteousness. Heavenly Father, we have chosen darkness instead of light we have chosen death instead of life forgive us let your light and life come to us again john also writes if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness having heard your confession and trusting in god's word and promises I announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Today's first reading, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The epistle lesson is from 1 John chapters 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, We make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Holy Gospel appointed for today, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear family of God at Grace, uh, today we begin a six-week adventure, a sermon series based on a neat little book entitled Flickering Lamps, Christ and His Church. And you know, today I have a confession to make. In 33 years of pastoral ministry, outside of Advent and the season of Lent, this is the very first time I've ever chosen to embark on a series of topical sermons. Together, over the next six weeks, we will zero in on these specific topics. Christ's purpose for his church, Christ's plans for his church, Christ's presence and his church, Christ's power and his church, Christ's provision and his church, and finally, Christ's preeminence and his church. Some of you may remember from your days of confirmation instruction that the word church can be and is used in different ways. The word church can refer to the building or the sanctuary, it can refer to a specific congregation like Grace Lutheran. It can refer to a national church body like our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. It can refer to the church Catholic with the small c, that is universal church. The church militant, those of us still on this side of heaven. It can also refer to the church triumphant the souls, the spirits of all who have already fallen asleep in Jesus and live with him in heaven. If you've had a chance to read our April newsletter, this little bit of background now will sound familiar. Our national church body, the LCMS, is made up of about 6,000 congregations. Each congregation holds membership in one of 35 different districts. We happen to belong to what is called the CNH district. 181 congregations and some of those are just preaching stations. But that is California from the northern border down to Lompoc, all of Nevada and all of Hawaii. And the district then is divided into circuits the circuit pastors gather on the second Tuesday of each month for prayer, for devotion, for 
study of a book, for open discussion, and also for mutual encouragement. For the past few months, the pastors in our circuit, we've been working through the book Flickering Lamps. It's by Henry and Richard Blackaby. And with their permission, we use their book for the framework of this sermon series. The book notes that across North America today, there are coffee shops, flea markets, condominiums, and even mosques in which people pray toward Mecca that once were church buildings. More than 4,000 churches in America close their doors each year. Today's church is under siege. The media mocks it. The government restricts it. Satan attacks it. Sin permeates it. Congregations that began with great promise dwindle in numbers, lose hope, and close their doors. This reality is heartbreaking. The authors who wrote this book, they wrote this book because they firmly believe that there is no reason for the church to die, not when Christ is its head. There are often times when churches must make changes, they say, sometimes quite drastic ones, but they need not die. God has a purpose for every church. They also write in full passionate confidence we know it is possible for a waning church to be born into a dynamic band of believers who dispel the darkness in their community and greatly advance God's kingdom but the book also clarifies one thing is abundantly clear no change is possible without the repentance of God's people. They must return in brokenness to him, genuinely seeking his face and listening to his voice. You know that word repentance, right? We are headed in the wrong direction, and God's words, his voice, call us back to himself calling us to do a, a complete turnaround back from our own direction, back to his way for us. And it is good, I believe, for repentance to begin at home. In our own church body, I cannot find any recent statistics which lead me to, to think that uh, we probably have nothing to brag about right now at this point in history. About 15 years ago, some published statistics showed that over 75% of our 6,000 congregations confirmed zero adults in the previous year. And 93 or 94%, I think it was, confirmed one or less. Ouch, we might say. And it might be easy to, to point a finger back to the recognition that the church is under siege. It's the media's fault. They mock us. Or it's the government's fault. They restrict us. Or it's Satan's fault. He attacks us. It's so easy to point a finger and ignore those three other fingers that might be pointing back to us. It's sin's fault. Sin permeates the church. But you know what? Jesus has a remedy for that. Question number 274 in our catechism pushes toward our remedy when it asks, Who are repentant believers? The answer, repentant believers are those who are sorry for their sin. Sometimes we use the word contrition. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's called faith. Back 
away from our own purposes back to the Lord's purpose for us, his church. So, the question, what is Christ's purpose for his church? Well, the book suggests that there are three purposes for Christ's church. First, to glorify God, to make disciples, and finally, to preserve and bless their communities. Listen carefully in a moment as I read and see if you can hear these three purposes of the church identified in the psalm that is appointed for today. Those purposes again, to glorify God, to make disciples, to preserve and bless their communities. Hear the words of Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the deeps. Fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. That's the psalm. So what do you think? Did you hear that it is our purpose to glorify God? <laughs> Yes, indeed, I think we did hear that. One commentary emphasizes it like this. The chorus in Psalm 148, the chorus summoned to praise the Lord in this psalm is so vast that it needs the dome of the universe for its concert hall. Its ranks are made up of all animate and inanimate creatures existing in sheer endless reaches of celestial space. That's verses 1 through 4 as well as in the terrestrial world from the monsters of the ocean's depths to the fruit trees on the hilltops. That's verses 5 through 10. And then there's that special section, verses 11 through 14. It is made up of human choristers embracing kings of the earth and all peoples, whether male or female, young or old. Voiceless and speechless, sun, moon, and stars nevertheless have much to say to glorify him, their creator. On earth, fire and hail, snow and frost, all hills and all cedars are eloquent in proclaiming the glory of their maker. And then this is the really key part. However, his people and his saints have more for which to worship him. He whose glory is above the heaven condescended to single out the people of Israel. That's his Old Testament church for a special gift of grace. When they seemed destined for distinction, he raised up a horn for them, that is, restored their vitality. Thinking on this and that word horn, I remember back to the summer of 1975. We had a 22-foot travel trailer, 
and we camped at a site in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, right there at the Elk Preserve. I so clearly remember the majesty of a few of those bull elk, their antlers, their horns. Some were six points on a side, others had seven on a side. Amazing. Some say that the psalmist may have had this horn picture in mind to depict the strength, the majesty, the triumph of the Lord's church. Well, this may be, but I prefer how Luke and the Holy Spirit quote Zechariah. Remember the the dad of John the baptizer? Pointing ahead to our Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 1, verses 68 and following. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear all our days. For this, his saving work for us, it is our duty to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. That is to give him glory. That is our purpose. Another purpose of ours is indeed to make disciples. This was also noted, I think, in Psalm 148, where all are called to praise the Lord, kings and all peoples, princes and rulers, young men and maidens, old men and children. Kind of sounds a lot like Jesus' own words, all nations, right, in Matthew chapter 28, where he directly gives his church purpose to make disciples by baptizing and by teaching Both things are done in order to make a disciple, the baptizing and the teaching. The normal order of doing things in in our church body is when a little one is, is young, we will baptize and we'll teach later. In the case of an adult who's already been hearing God's word, many times we will teach first and then baptize if they haven't been yet. But both things go together to make a disciple. In that little flickering lamps book, the authors encourage churches to ask themselves, naming their, our own church, if Grace Lutheran was not here, who would notice? And I think that's a really great question because it helps us to ponder what we do, and I think it also helps us to ponder why we do what we do. So, who would miss us if we weren't here? Well, I think it goes without saying that we all would miss being here. But that is not the question. The question is not about us. The question the authors would like us to ask is what we might call other-focused. To whom do we reach? Well, I'm guessing if we were not here, a bunch of preschoolers and their families would miss us. A bunch of elementary schoolers and their families would miss us. A number of special education Sunday schoolers would miss us. I am quite certain that some Mission Mites recipients would miss us. And now some online worshipers would miss us, ones that we do not know, and some we will probably never meet until heaven. Isn't that an awesome thing that God's word can be shared by us with people we don't even know and the Lord can still do his work? Our purpose as Jesus' church is to glorify God and to make disciples and and to preserve and bless our communities. This third purpose of ours may not be as readily recognized in Psalm 148, 
but I believe it is in there. As we glorify God, others are drawn into his praise and built up. And as we make disciples, baptizing and teaching, they go home or they go to work or they go to school, preserving and blessing the communities where they are. That is why we are here, is it not? I believe the authors get it right when they note Usually, the members of a new church have a keen sense of why they are beginning a particular work. However, over time, that sense of purpose can fade. Rather than being on a mission for God, churches can degenerate into religious bureaucracies. Now their concern is filling vacancies on their committees or, or staffing their current programming rather than reaching people and impacting their community. They continue, At times, church members fixate on facility upkeep or doing business as usual until they forget why God commissioned them in the first place. It's helpful, they say, to remember that in over 2,000 years of church history, God has never established a church whose purpose it was to maintain its property. Church buildings are simply a means to an end. They are never the end. Long time ago, in an evangelism class that I had at the seminary, it was said that if 10 new people, 10 visitors came to church on one particular Sunday, that about three of those 10 were there because they saw the building and decided to step in or because they were visited by an evangelism committee. But you know what? About seven of the 10 were there because a friend or a family member personally invited them. Come sit with me. Come hear of my Jesus. He is your Jesus too. And in our day and age now, with this online stuff, we can invite folks there too. If they're not able to get out or if they live long, long and far away, we can say, check it out. Check things out at this site. Come sit with me. Come tune in with me and hear of my Jesus. He is your Jesus too. Personal evangelism or personal invitation, the evangelism team and public relations, all are important. And all of the above serve to preserve and bless our communities to make disciples, and to glorify God. These are our purposes here. In the name of Jesus, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts, your minds faithful in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting, amen. Today we speak together the words of our faith using the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. 
whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O precious Savior Jesus Christ, there is no work or sacrifice we can do to turn away God's wrath from us. But eternal thanks be to you, because through your suffering and death on the cross, you have won full pardon for our sins and established peace with God in our behalf. This peace God announced unmistakably to the whole world when he raised you from the dead. Now peace and forgiveness will always be ours, for you ever live to make intercession for us in heaven. Our ever-living Lord, this peace which you brought to us sinners fills our souls with a holy joy, for we know that whenever we meet God, we shall stand before him unaccused, uncondemned, and unpunished and that at the last we will be received into the eternal joys of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, Father, though the reminders of your curse upon sin are still evident in the thorns, the thistles, and weeds that plague the ground, in the toil, the pain, and death that are so much a part of this temporal life, Nevertheless, fill our hearts with peace so that these things hold no terror for us. As our Father in Christ Jesus, hear us when we pray, and according to your will, remove the things that distress us. And so that we may experience the peace which passes all understanding, pardon our offenses as we daily plead the merits of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the faith to receive God's offer of peace through Christ. Grant that we remain steadfast in our faith so that we may never lose our redemption purchased with the Savior's blood. Cause the peace which God has declared through Christ to rule our hearts so bountifully that we will serve our God in all that we do and live in peace and love with our fellow human beings. Broadcast throughout the world that message of pardon and peace in the crucified and risen Christ and draw the hearts of sinners to the Savior, calling them to repentance. In the blessed name of Jesus we ask it. Amen. Together as God's people, we pray our family prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear people of God, if, if you were with us here in person today, this is the point in the service where we would celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, Holy Communion, we sometimes call it. And that's something we really can't do online. Uh, it's something we need to be here in person for. And so if you are ever able to join us and join us for the Lord's Supper, that wonderful gift that our Lord gives, the, the bread, the wine, and his words say, this is my body, this is my blood, take eat, take drink for the forgiveness of your sins. What an awesome gift. We join in the post-communion prayer. 
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the light and life to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith so that we may always be prepared to confess you as Lord and God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him 
evermore and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more.